And I'm here with the smiling assassin, Adam Cook. You. Yo, where's that nickname come from? Uh, Is it because you're so happy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, so um, uh, that came from one of the first gyms I trained at back in Tasmania. Yep. Um, and again, it just came from, I was just constantly smiling on the mat, really. But um, yeah, <laughs> like to like, <laughs> like to try to be a little bit of an assassin as well. So yeah, uh, yeah two and two got put together. It was one of the ones where I, yeah, just, I, I, I didn't really choose it. It just yeah. kind of got um, given to me. I'm just imagining you like like rolling or something and just smiling like so much, just like, putting <laughs> someone on an armbar. Like, this, I love this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's it, man. Um, I, I think uh, a training is obviously what makes me happy. And uh, yeah. I like to um kind of embrace that. When did uh when did you know that martial arts was was like oh this is my thing? When when did that come in? Was it the kickboxing? To, was it taekwondo you started in? I can't remember. Uh, l- like a freestyle karate, but yeah, freestyle like basically karate. just like a, a traditional martial art there. Um, that started off as self defense. Um, but I guess like when I knew it was my thing was pretty early on in life. Uh wow. I mean, I've been saying that uh I wanted to teach martial arts it's it's kind of a separate thing between martial arts and mixed martial arts like i didn't know about mma for a little while Mm. but even growing up as a kid like i wanted to run my own traditional martial arts like dojo and uh like going through high school that was how i made like my pocket money and stuff um was like teaching classes so i guess like kind of i fell in love with martial arts i started at seven um again with the traditional karate and like Straight away, I knew that I loved it. But as far as like a job um, sort of thing, it's like what I wanted to do with my life. Uh, again, about age 13, 14, again, I was in high school. And um, yeah, yeah, I started teaching. One of my first gigs was teaching a program called the Little Ninjas Program, which was uh, three to six-year-olds. And um, <laughs> yeah, seeing like the three to six-year-olds in like a little gi with their little white belt and stuff, it's, it's pretty cute. They, yeah, they do cute. some pretty uh, some pretty adorable things. It, it's fun. But um, no, but being lucky enough to be able to do that and find my passion early on in life is um, something I'm pretty grateful for. Mm. Yeah, finding the passion early on is um, I've found that to be quite difficult for myself with like trying to find out like what is the thing that kind of gets me going and some people really do find it early or you have to try a lot of stuff but so how old were you so high school high school you were like this is yeah 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 so um uh, again this was even so this wasn't uh, even as far as competing goes, like uh, fighting to make money, but this was just more like tra- teaching traditional teaching. like karate. Um, and I knew that I wanted to do that again, like e- ever since I've had my first little gig doing it uh, mm. again, it was like, uh, so what? Yeah. Yeah. It would have been age 13 um, that wow. I started t- teaching with the kids. And then ever cool. since I started doing that, um, it wasn't a lot of money, of course, <laughs> but um, it was enough just to, like I said, give me a little bit of extra pocket money by, um, some McDonald's here and there after high school and stuff <laughs> yeah. if I needed it. But uh, yeah, so so that was enough. And ever since I was I was doing that, I just thought, yeah, I'd want to keep doing this. So just when you say karate, because um, I remember, because I started in karate when I was ooh, four. I think I did it for a bit. I grew up in the UK and then I moved to New Zealand. So I did a little bit of karate there, came here. Karate was a really hot thing. I had like a real <laughs> like moment in time for probably, I don't know how many years. But that was like the martial art or like the style like it kids just did. Yeah. Whereas I didn't hear about jujitsu. Literally, I don't think until I watched the UFC. I didn't even know what that was. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was the thing. <laughs> um, so like karate, I think it come from like the Hollywood movies and the Bruce yeah. Lee and the Jackie Chan. And there were a lot of people that I think had this... Um, Kind of, kind of like delusional thought, like around karate, <laughs> like you, you could get to this level where you were just like untouchable, and you would, you know, like fight off like Doing five like, or what six they call guys. Like the, the knife hands. Like yeah, that. yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly, and like you know, like spearheading people in the throat with your fingers and doing a bunch of stupid stuff. But um, <laughs> but no, uh, then jujitsu came along in the UFC. Then I think it completely did a one eighty. Uh, everyone's seen like these karate guys come in and get choked out by these jujitsu guys or by the, the Gracie family by, um, yeah. Uh, That's uh, right. That was, that was the 90s uh, UFC. Eh? Is that right? The so Gracie, the Gracie family. What, what about them? Oh, that was the 90s UFC. Was it? 
Oh, yes. Like, yeah, yeah, really yeah. So, early on. Uh, 1993, then, the first yeah. ever UFC uh, with Hoist right. Gracie. Um, mm. He went through a killer's row of uh, strikers and just choked everyone out. <laughs> <laughs> um, which, uh, uh, again, uh, made everyone do like a full 180 um, on their belief with like karate and jujitsu and like ground fighting and striking, mm. which was um, pretty revolutional. Obviously, at the time, it was, uh, yeah, pretty crazy. Yeah, it's like, um, it's, it really goes to show like when I've watched those professional fights and that, because I grew up, if I'd, I mean, I didn't really know it, but UFC till like Conor McGregor, he's kind of the, I didn't really know about it before then. And I don't know about boxing, Muay Thai, and um, yeah, like I do traditional martial arts, uh, karate, kung fu. Um, I did hap keto for a bit. Um, I, oh, gave, nice. I gave that a go. I found that some of that stuff real cool. Like they teach you um, like the, all the pressure point stuff. Yeah, and like uh, wrist locks and yeah, stuff. Yeah, they, they can get pretty gnarly. Um, but um, I, I remember, I think, like the idea of like MMA and like mixing it up. I think, yeah, as soon as I saw like like the UFC. And then um, I, I know about wrestling. And I watched these guys, especially if it's those Dagestani guys, and just being like, oh, wow, like you can be a great kickboxer. That doesn't mean anything if <laughs> someone gets a hold of you. So yep. suddenly now I think... From what I've seen, the evolution of those fights, because I love w- w- watching some old UFC stuff or even old fighting MMA comps, is you now have to be the master of like <laughs> about four different styles to be able to like keep up. Because I think like if you watch like, uh, and if I watch like some of the early stuff, you just a, some of the guys are just good strikers and stuff, and there's a bit of wrestling, but you know, like if you, it depends who you're up against, I suppose. But I think most Westerners generally were all like boxing kickboxing strike or striking orientated for a while from what i saw is that kind of right and yeah. then so so it had like different paths really so like uh like different generations and different ages within um mma so like to begin with it wasn't even mma it wasn't mixed martial arts it mm. was putting style against style to see which style was the best yeah and then uh, after that, there was sort of, again, like different generations, different ages. There was a while there where then jujitsu took over. So everyone was like, okay, you, you have to have like good jujitsu. You need to be a jujitsu, like black belt sort of thing. And then after that came the wrestling, like the uh, the sprawl and brawl sort of age or era. Sprawl where, and brawl like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> where, uh, again, all these high level wrestlers came in and just started taking people down and were able to keep top pressure enough just to beat the crap out of guys with good ground and pound. Mm. Um and it's so then, tiring if you get that, like, when you're on the oh, ground wrestled, it's just exhausting. Yeah, yeah. There's a reason why, you know, they say embrace the grind when it comes to wrestling. That term isn't really used too much for kickboxing or jujitsu, but there's a reason why it's used for wrestling. And, like, um, yeah, the the cardio output is uh, quite intense mm. for, for that one specific domain. Because mm. um, you've, uh, are you, uh, what, what's your belt in jujitsu? Uh, jujitsu, my ranking is a purple belt. Purple belt. Awesome. Yep. Was that really hard to get? I mean, because I've heard stories that that's one of the hardest ones to get. uh, No, (laughs) so a lot of people look at like after you get your purple belt, it's just a matter of sticking at it uh, and doing the same thing until you get your black belt. Where most people sort of quit a blue belt level, like they get their first Mm. sort of belt, they get the idea of it, but then it's like you can see the hard yards put ahead. Mm. Whereas like there's a saying where it's like a black belt, just like a purple belt, they never quit. Um, um, you, ju- you just have to, after you get to that purple belt level, you're at like a sort of advanced enough level where, uh, again, it's it's just about refining the skills and honing and just, uh, again, just showing up and putting in the time. But I mean, uh, that's that's really all it is like from the beginning (laughs) that's all it is for anyone really what have you found out of like the mixed martial arts uh the ones you've done what have you found to be the most challenging that's a great question like which style have you been like this is i need to spend some time on this this is harder than say i don't know so i've enjoyed no matter what I, i love spending time in all of them um i think the one that i found was most challenging and possibly most humbling for me um, was quite possibly the wrestling. So for my personal experience, what happened was, um, again, I was into striking. I was into like traditional karate and kickboxing and stuff first. Um, I achieved uh, my black belt there. Uh, that took uh, just over 10 years. Um, and I, I got to like quite a proficient level at striking. And then I discovered jujitsu. And mm. discovering jujitsu for me at the time was just more um, fun if anything, it was like, wow, there's this whole new world that like sort of gets opened up to me. Um, and like I said, I just was able to embrace that and look at like the fun side of things. But then I had striking and I was building on my jujitsu, 
but uh, the, where where I was living, there was never any wrestling. Um, so I never got exposed to that until mm. I moved from Tasmania to the mainland, uh, uh, Queensland, Australia. And then I I felt like I'd already achieved a good level. At this point in time, I'd, I'd actually already uh, got myself a, a belt. Um, it was uh, for a promotion called Valor, which was the, the biggest promotion. It was the most followed promotion um, online in Australia there for a while. Uh, it was uh, quite a good promotion until the uh, <laughs> until the guy in charge had to go to jail. But unfortunately, he ran it into the ground. It, it, he had something really, really good there for a couple of years. But anyway, that's that's a story for a different day. But <laughs> anyway, enough. so I was able to uh, I got to like the sort of the the top echelon level um, in Tasmania there for a bit. Um, again, I, I was the first ever lightweight champion of that promotion. So then I went to Queensland to sort of try to better myself and grow my knowledge of that. But again, I I got there without doing practically any wrestling. <laughs> and then, <laughs> so I'd already had a belt. I was like a champion of a promotion. And then uh, I, I discovered the hard way at this gym called uh, Puma in the Gold Coast, um, stands for Potential Unlimited Mixed Martial Arts, that... Um, wrestling is quite important and uh, <laughs> yeah. we're doing some basic wrestling drills i was in like one of the, the fighters class the pro class and i can still remember to this day there was so the the coach was telling us all right we're starting 50 50 um which is a position where uh, uh, you both have an underhook each and i was like oh what what's 50 50 or what's over unders and my partner at the time looked at me and he's like you have a belt and you don't know what 50 50 is or like what over unders are and like that, the way he looked at me, I knew that I was really missing something. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, after after that wrestling class and after those drills, I was just completely aware of this whole game that uh, I had missed. Where, like I said, that was the most challenging for me because um, I'd always I'd always tried to build myself and build my fight knowledge. But I just didn't have that avenue um, where I was at at the mm. time. So again, I'd been training for like before I moved to Queensland, uh, 12, 13 years. And take two. All right, that was embarrassing. <laughs> For everyone who's listening, I just had a quick quick little edit. Uh, my, my laptop died halfway through. Well done, Scott. So Adam was continuing on with his story about moving. Uh, he was in the Queensland gym, and he's talking about the wrestling. Yes, yes. Uh, so you, you asked me what uh, what was the, style, the, the, the most challenging yeah. s- sort of style. Um, again, for, for me, wrestling was definitely the, the most challenging and humbling because I, I'd already poured so much of my life into uh, trying to learn as much as I could. And I thought with learning the stand-up and learning the ground game that I was learning like striking and grappling. But then I realized that there was this whole world of wrestling that I'd missed out on, especially mm-hmm. like work up against the cage uh, or uh, again, just, just anything in general, like just even being able to shoot a decent double leg. And getting like putting up against the wall, right? Yes. And yeah. And how, how to get out of like, I watch, I watch like you guys do that. Cause I've just started doing a little bit of wrestling and I noticed like, I haven't done that stuff yet. And I'm like, that's another whole world as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, again, discovering that, Again, there was this whole new world that I had been missing out on when I'd already considered myself to to, to sort of be um, a, c- quite a good mixed martial artist. And then again, just seeing that huge hole in my game that, um, like I said, was definitely the most challenging and the most humbling sort of aspect. Uh, what made it, I think, a little bit worse was uh, I still remember one day when the head coach um, sort of turned to me and he said to me one day that, uh, he's like, are you sure you don't want to like just do Muay Thai? Like, are you sure? Like, <laughs> uh, the gym we're at in Burley Heads was close to John Wayne Parr's gym, and he actually kind of recommended me go over there and like get palmed <laughs> off to to sort of uh, John Wayne Parr, which would have been amazing. But um, I've always been interested in mixed martial arts, knowing the whole picture. Yeah. But again, that one kind of hurt and cut me a little bit deep. That. Ooh. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah that the head coach rather than have me as like part of the team was kind of like, are you sure you just don't want to be a striker? Are you sure you just don't want to focus on this kickboxing <laughs> stuff that you seem to like so much? Um, mm. But yeah, so so that um, to answer your question, yeah, re- wrestling was definitely the 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 most difficult for me to uh, sort of come to grips with and implement into my game. But uh, 
yeah, uh, of course, absolutely zero regrets that I finally did. <laughs> yeah, no, good stuff. Yeah, I've um, yeah, for me, I've uh, I've always just done martial arts you know, very casually, and then uh, I noticed it starting at CKB, the jujitsu, and because uh, normally I think I hadn't been to a mixed martial arts gym, and every gym I notice if you, it's like you go do boxing here, it's just boxing. You do my tie here, it's just my tie. Mm-hmm. You go jujitsu, it's just jujitsu. You go karate gym, it's just you know, it's like every gym is like that's it. So I hadn't really found MMA's really taken off, obviously, the last like ten years from what I've seen in New Zealand. Yep. Um, and so more of that has popped up now. So it's like a gym now offers more than just your standard like we just do one thing here and yes. that's it. Um, so that definitely is like great for me because like oh I can still I can like dabble in different things, but obviously changing completely mind your mindset entirely to uh you know the adapting to a style that you just yeah for me i'm just like oh my god my, especially like because i started in boxing and um i just do like amateur rounds and that and i did kickboxing and i was like oh, i'm not gonna worry about kicks but i'm always standing and then suddenly the groundwork it's like oh now <laughs> i don't even know what's happening down here yeah and uh and just the exhaustion i was like i thought my cardio was okay and it's not, apparently, because <laughs> my cardio is not, I'm not equipped for, I'm not equipped for having somebody on top of me trying to strangle me to death. No, definitely. Um, that, so that, 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 that was one of the biggest, like, like, I mean, I don't know if it was humbling. It was more like, fuck. I was just <laughs> like, oh, I, I wanted to give it a go. Um, but it was just very, it was just so different from what I'd ever done before. Just had never done anything like it. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, I want to get back more into the, the JIT stuff. But like the the wrestling and stuff, I've been really enjoying recently. Really fun. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. But that's also, I find that not as crazy, like it's crazy, but it's definitely a bit more harder on the body, the wrestling I've found so far. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I think uh, a lot of people also struggle to do wrestling at like a, a lighter pace. <laughs> so <laughs> most of the time, again, we talked about the expression before, like embrace the grind. Like yeah. wrestling, I feel like is such a heavy momentum, uh, momentum heavy sort of aspect of combat sports mm. where it's like uh, uh, a lot of people like you go full hundy. Uh, a lot of people, <laughs> w- w- even when you're drilling, it's like you, you, you drill pretty hard, mm. um, which again, obviously takes its toll just like a little bit more than just like yeah. playing around with some light light sparring or doing some flow rolling with some jets i almost and- find getting taken down more tiring than taking someone down <laughs> <laughs> i've been taken down a lot recently in the rest like i'm like oh this is like almost as tiring as taking the opponent down <laughs> yeah yeah for Cause, sure because you're thinking about all those what is it called the whiz uh putting in those um i try to remember the yeah, terms yeah, overhooks, there. overhooks what, what? So i was coming down and then i'm just, <laughs> I'm just like man i don't know what's more tiring no i mentioned uh especially if they're you know making making you carry their weight as well you know you got someone on mm. top of you you know you're trying to get up and they're yeah again putting all their weight on you it's uh it's definitely not easy mm, mm. yeah um so coming from australia to new zealand's an interesting move why why what was the attractive was it was it ckb was that yeah yeah entirely 100%. the reason a hundred percent right so, so when did you first hear about city kickboxing uh great question so what happened for me was uh as <laughs> i was actually in las vegas at the time so as i mentioned wrestling was like the last aspect of my game that uh, sorry the, the last aspect of martial arts for me to, to add to my game and it, w- it has been like a, a spot where i was lacking so uh, I said to myself, well, where's, where's the best spot to go to learn wrestling? Mm. And this was before, um, like a lot of the Dagestani guys, I guess, <laughs> had come through and had their wave. Um, and for me, it was all about America. So I'm like, oh, yeah. I, I need to go to America to American learn how wrestling. to wrestle. Yeah, mm. yeah. So my train of thought was wrestling is my weakest aspect. So I need to go to America to learn wrestling, to, to, mm. to, to increase that. So I was over in America. I was training in Las Vegas. It was also the time when uh, the PI had just been um, just been opened up in Las Vegas, the UFC Performance Institute, which is an incredible facility. Um, UFC has always been my goal. So I thought if I could try to get some roots around Las Vegas and around the PI, there would be a really, really good um, base for when I make it into the UFC and then I'm familiar with the PI and that sort of stuff. So I was training in Vegas, um, working at a gym there, um, it, it, it was, it was a really, really good experience and I'm definitely happy that I'd done it, but I could just tell that it was only going to be a temporary thing for me at this gym. Uh, things weren't quite clicking. Okay. I was getting good training, good rounds, learning a lot. But again, I could just tell that the gym wasn't quite for me. Um, 
Well, if you don't mind me asking, what sort of what was what stuck out to you? Why didn't it work for you? People there, the vibe was it, or like the training regimens you found to be a little bit like not sure about this. Or? Yeah, yeah, the vibe. Um, I seen also how the the coach um was uh. <laughs> <laughs> was communicating with with some of his fighters there, and I I just didn't quite uh, agree with where he was coming from. Right. Um. But I, again, it was yeah, just just kind of more of like a general vibe. Um. I, I knew that again, that gym wasn't quite for me. But uh, at the time, it was. I'm just trying to think. So this was 2018. I do believe I might have to double check that. It could have been right at the start of 2019. Right. Um, but either way, around that sort of era. And uh, I watched Israel fight Kelvin Gaslam. And it was a combination of not only watching that fight, but I also listened to a podcast uh, around the same time. And it was a Kevin Lee podcast with Joe Rogan. And Joe Rogan has spoke to Kevin Lee and what he spoke to him about was he recommended Kevin Lee go to a coach and a trainer called Faraz Sahabi, mm. who, who uh, teaches at a gym called TriStar. And the reason why he recommended him go to that gym was because Faraz trained George St. Pierre. Yeah. And oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's GSP's coach. Uh, wow. One of them, he had a, quite a couple of trainers, but that was his head like MMA gym was TriStar MMA in Canada. And the reason why Joe Rogan told uh, Kevin Lee to go train there was because Kevin Lee's game was so similar to George to George's mm. uh, that the coaches knew how to coach a fighter like him. Mm. So I thought about using that advice kind of like flip to myself where my school of thought beforehand was like, I need to go to America to train with the wrestlers and get better at my wrestling, even though I'm... Um, my highlights is definitely my striking. Whereas after hearing that, I thought maybe what I needed to do is instead of going to a, an extremely wrestle heavy gym, what I needed to do was to go to a striking gym that knew how to deal with the wrestling and oh, knew how yeah, instead right. of just uh, focusing on improving my wrestling, both offense and defense, maybe what I needed to do was get to a gym that knew how to deal with the wrestling and really highlight my striking and mm. maybe work with some coaches that, uh, again, are, are used to high-level strikers and can coach them through, uh, uh, again, the, 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 the wrestling points. And then, obviously, uh, watching that Kelvin Gaslam fight with uh, Israel afterwards, uh, it kind of made me think, wow, well, like, They've got something special going on in New Zealand at, the, at, at this point in time. You know, you've got mm. guys like uh, like Izzy, like Dan, like mm. Kai. who had all these um, high-level guys from this side of the world that were doing so extremely well in striking but then also dealing with the wrestling and, and uh, yeah, how to go about yeah, that. Yeah, that's something I, I saw. Oh, I can't watch fight it was. It was with Izzy and his uh, takedown defense was just like pretty I was just like wow like yeah like uh, I'd, I'd never seen like someone deal with like a takedown defense so well I could have possibly yeah. been yeah the Derek Brunson fight I remember Might that was been. one of the big ones because that was one of his big tests against a high level wrestler mm. it, it could have also actually been his debut against uh, Robert Wilkinson who um, uh, is actually from Tasmania where I'm from as well oh, so I, I, I watched that <laughs> um, I, I'd seen Israel compete uh, at, at home uh, in Melbourne um and i've been watching him ever since he fought someone else from tasmania mm. uh, a guy called stuart dare and i i watched him he knocked stuart dare out with a question mark kick and i knew it was yeah. a beautiful knockout he landed it before but the way he set it up again later on was just uh, yeah on point um and ever since that fight I, i'd been taking like close notice and then watching rob fight him i knew that rob was uh or in my opinion, a little bit more of a level up than, than Stu. So, again, these guys, they were from a gym back home in Tasmania. It was one of the only gyms that uh, had wrestling. It was down the very south part of the island. Mm. So, um, they were, again, <laughs> in in going back, uh, when Valor first came in, when Mixed Martial Arts first came to Tasmania, um, it was very, very much, even though it was the early 2000s, it was very much like the early 90s uh, as far as mixed martial arts went where 
what happened when MMA came to Tasmania was it was every gym style competing against other gym styles. Mm. So it was like our gym was like a karate gym. Like it was even it wasn't even called a gym. It was more a dojo. So uh, it was <laughs> cool. like us trying to prove that karate was like the shit. Oh. And it was against, uh, again, like um, uh, other boxing gyms who thought that boxing was the shit. And then it was against guys mm. down south, uh, uh, jujitsu gyms. And, mm. and again, there was only like one gym really in – the, the whole island that are decent wrestling or focus on wrestling. Um, yeah. And that, that was out of a gym called HTC, Hybrid Training Center. And they were, again, right down the southern part of the island. So it was like a four-hour drive, a little bit too far to go on the daily to improve <laughs> my wrestling, unfortunately. But it was right. actually one place that I did contemplate going down um, and moving down there to train. Um, unfortunately, I chose to move to Queensland to train my wrestling instead. But uh, again, it was it was definitely still an option because it was the one part of the island that actually uh, again um, had some decent wrestling. So anyway, watching Israel fight these guys from that gym, I'm like, oh, how does this how does this striker deal with these wrestlers? Like, how does how, how does he yeah again deal with the shot and still um, not restrict his striking because he's worried about them shooting on him? Mm. And so I watched him again fight Stu, and he did it perfectly to a T. And then I watched him fight Robert Wilkinson. And uh, again, I knew Rob was like the guy from this gym. He was like um, uh, the the gym owner was a guy called Priscus Foginolo. Um, he is one of the most experienced mixed martial artists uh, in Australia. He was there fighting way back in the CFC days. I remember he actually stole, well, not stole, he came up with it first. I... Uh, before I was given the name the Smiling Assassin, I was actually thinking about the Tasmanian Devil um, being from Tasmania. <laughs> yeah, cool, and I can cool. remember way back in the day, this would have been maybe 2013, 2014, I watched Priscus Foginolo. He fought in a CFC fight, which is an old promotion um, in Australia in the mainland. And he was announced as the Tasmanian Devil. And I was like, oh, well, there goes that. <laughs> but uh, anyway, Priscus is... Um, been around for years. He's one of the OGs for mixed martial arts um, uh, for Australia, but especially Tasmania. Mm. So Priscus and uh, Rob Wilkinson were definitely like the the two like extremely high level guys to to look out for. And then watching Izzy fight Rob uh, for his UFC debut uh, again, that was extremely exciting to me because again, it was like the um, the my. <laughs> I don't want to say like nemesis, but like like the guy that I would like fear most like fighting is like this super wrestle heavy guy that's going to try to take me down and just lay on top of me. Mm. So especially back then, I didn't know how to deal with that so much. Um, so watching uh, that fight get matched and then get made, um, I, I was super excited for it. But then anyway, so I watched, I watched that fight. And then I knew from then on, obviously, uh, yeah, Israel knew how, how to deal with the wrestling quite well because if you look back at that fight, he, he deals with it extremely well. Mm. Um, then again, uh, I just continued to watch and continued to watch until, like I said, I, I watched him fight in the Kelvin Gastelum fight. And then uh, from there, from there, City Kickboxing had already made themselves like any, uh, a really big name um again they had like a staple of guys there like i said i i mentioned guys before like high car france mm. dan hooker obviously um again just extremely high level guys so instead of moving to america i thought new zealand is possibly a little bit closer than america <laughs> yeah. you know it, it yeah. won't be as hard to see my family and stuff at christmas time and um again yeah, obviously that gym knows what to do and how to deal with wrestlers so mm. maybe we'll come over and we'll, we'll see what that's about True. Yeah. That's um. That, oh, thanks for the, the bit of bit of uh, going into the detail there. That was, that was cool <laughs> to learn about that. Um. Yeah. I. I uh, when I. Well, when, when I like look at the like you like a lot of the different styles of, of fighters who are coming in at the moment, especially from CKB. One guy I've been watching. Um. Uh. Some of his fights because he got in. Was it like Kevin Jusay like last year? Because he's judo. Yes. Which is uh. I don't. I, I mean, apart from. I can't remember other fighters that come to my mind. Ronda Rousey was one. I think she was a judo as well. A couple of judo, but it's not super common from what I've seen in UFC. Or is it? Maybe I've missed that. No, <laughs> no, no. So judo isn't as common. Um, but uh, Cause, again, cause when he does it. He does like the full judo, like uh, yeah, takedowns and stuff. And I'm like, oh, I hardly ever see those. Yeah, um, and he does it real flawlessly. So I'm just yeah. Like, so hey, watch out for him. <laughs> uh, definitely, Kev. Um, 
Kev gets his name Air Juicier uh, because yeah. yeah, he he takes guys for a ride. He he sends it, <laughs> he sends them flying. But um, no, uh, he has an extremely strong judo base, and mm. uh, judo in general is a really really strong martial art because. Not only does it focus on the takedown, but it also does a fair bit of groundwork as well. And like, uh, again, in judo, you have a time limit on how fast to finish on the ground too, if you are going for a submission. So it applies mm. like the pressure um, quite well. Uh, but, uh, uh, sorry, lost where I was going. Uh, again, Kev, <laughs> That's all right. Kev has an extremely strong judo base, uh, but again, he has built himself up. Uh, to be a phenomenal all-round uh, fighter. Mm. Like, he's striking, as he demonstrated in his last fight. Yeah. His yeah. jab was beautiful, on point. Mm. It looked like uh, he'd been striking for as long as he'd been doing judo. Mm. Um, again, he just, uh, I guess, all the, the work he's put in at City, kick, kick, city Kickboxing has really paid <laughs> off there. Sure. I guess um, to delve away a little bit from the fighting, I kind of want to, as uh, from Tasmania, you lived in Australia, you lived in America, you've been in New Zealand now five years? Uh, just under, yeah, just yeah. Under so five uh, years. I got here just before the pandemic. Uh, Lovely 2020. timing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was four weeks before uh, we all went into lockdown. Oh man, that's unfortunate. Because I wanted to like, like uh, as like an Australian coming to New Zealand. What are like the you know we have our like you know Australians and Kiwis have like a few similarities, but we have our differences. What are the things that you find to be like culturally a little bit different coming to New Zealand? Oh, that's a good one. Uh, the, you know, to be honest, it's it's more the opposite way. I. I after coming here, I just see culturally how similar we are. One thing that one huge difference between Australia and New Zealand that I really, really love about New Zealand is how well, uh, how well the Maori culture is looked after here and well represented is here and how they try and keep it uh, ingrained into like normal everyday like sort of society, like on the bus like you'll be you'll be traveling from stop A to stop B, and they'll do the announcements both in English and in Maori, which is mm. really really cool. Um, unfortunately, back home um, in Australia, as specifically Tasmania, where I'm from, there mm. is next to no Aboriginal culture, um, mm. which is um, v- very very unfortunate. Obviously, it was a different time, and things were dealt very very wrong back then, um, but. Uh, yeah, w- one thing that I do really, really love about New Zealand is uh, how well they've kept the Maori culture ingrained into uh, their everyday sort of life. I think that's really cool. Mm. Yeah, the um, historically, I think it was in the 1900s, which was, this is a very big subject, so I don't want to go into all the details about it. Um, but when it comes to the language part specifically, yep. um, that was taken away, I think, uh, in, uh, in early 1900s in New Zealand, which... Uh, I think was a bit stupid, but they have been bringing it back more and more. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I sort of personally believe it's good. To, it's nice to do have like a bit of both. Um, some people get funny about it. Some people get upset about it. I think it's, you know, like it's it's not really a problem. And it makes us also unique in the blend of kind of the blend of that culture. Uh, however, there are other things about it as well, which um, it's very complicated as it is in Australia as well, I imagine, you know, talking about natives to Australians and there can be like a, yeah. <laughs> it's definitely a touchy subject. And it's definitely a, a complicated subject. But mm. again, I, I really enjoy um, learning learning more about like the multiculture and learning uh, just, uh, again, the, the different viewpoints. You know, watching the haka is always really, really cool from the guys yeah, at the sure, gym. Sure. Seeing uh, guys give... I don't want to mess up my pronunciations, which have been terrible, but uh, I think it's called a huni, where, where they press a honey. Yeah, that's right. There yeah, you go. yeah. You um, just little things like that. Um, I think is really, really cool, and I really, uh, again, appreciate like learning like a different, uh, a different culture. Um, unfortunately, in uh, Tasmania, there was absolutely zero uh, of that for like um, the, the Aboriginals. Mm. Yeah, that, that's a brutal one for sure. Uh, I mean, yeah, sending all your prisoners from the UK to Australia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, not not good. I mean, yeah, it, it's hard. It's there's, hard. There's always I, that funny joke. I've about copped that. it. 
<laughs> I've got it hard, uh, especially being from Tasmania, because it's yeah. like Australia, the way that some people look at it and the way that I've had it reflected on to me is like Australia is like the convicts and the <laughs> the rejects from like the UK. And yeah. then Tasmania is like the rejects of the rejects. <laughs> they're, they're then like the terrible ones they didn't even want in Australia that they've yeah. been sent down to Tasmania. Um, I just found that was like a great video about it. Like, oh, we'll send all these convicts, people we don't want from grey like miserable uk to like sunny like really beautiful australia like oh damn because <laughs> yeah. comparatively um I, I much prefer australia to the uk <laughs> ah, awesome awesome why well, I, I haven't been to the uk so i can't give the same comparison but um I uh, it, it's more like australia. for the daily life just the positivity like um you know obviously being kiwi i like giving aussie shit and vice versa <laughs> but um when i go there people are generally more positive and uh I think that's something I, I like and people are a bit more enthusiastic. I've kind of talked a bit of shit on this podcast about Kiwis a little bit, but one of my big takeaways is uh, in New Zealand is we're not always the most encouraging and enthusiastic. Um, sometimes that sort of is not always, uh, you know, like we're very humble, arguably sometimes too humble, and it gets a little bit like uh, people are just sort of like, oh, I don't really want to, you know, uh, how it, tall poppy syndrome that's what we call it yeah yeah whereas like in australia it's like uh you guys are definitely louder but i definitely appreciate sort of people being more positive and more up for things i think people are more excited to do things and like you know but it's also a bigger population there's more opportunities in australia so i do find it always interesting but i understand from the martial art point like ckb is quite special but for other things most people leave <laughs> yeah yeah i actually get that a fair bit um where uh, uh, me and both my partner um specifically everyone always like so they ask us uh so you you're from australia and you optionally chose to, to move here to new zealand like, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. like what why what what was the go there but um no, I, I really like it here. And again, obviously the, the gym was the number one reason and why we came here. But uh, like I said, I, I, I enjoy the people. I enjoy p- people here are friendly enough just as long mm. as you stay away from Queen Street. Uh, sorry, uh, K uh, Road. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> as long as you stay away from, um, you know, <laughs> some crowds here. But uh, no, p- p- people in general are, um, have been pretty friendly and pretty welcoming here. Have you traveled much of New Zealand yet? Uh, no. <laughs> no. No. So that's one Just thing. Just training I, day in, day out. I, I yeah. always say that I'm going to get better for it because people still give me shit for that quite a bit that um, <laughs> I, I, I like don't really leave the yeah. city a whole lot. I haven't really seen like the real New Zealand. Um, mm. haven't really been down to, uh, <laughs> that's always classic, the real New Zealand. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, I relate to it. I was lucky enough to go see, uh, Theo Vaughn, uh, earlier on this year and oh, he, yeah, I went to it. So it was fun. Oh, nice. Yeah. Well, he had a bit, um, uh, talking about how, it's funny when you get here and you just rock up, people tell you that you have to go somewhere else. Like, mm. like, and, and <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I, I relate to that a hundred percent because I get here and I've got to like this awesome city that I really like. And, uh, everyone's just like, Oh, have you been down South? Have you been up North? Have you been to Queenstown? Ha- have you, have you gone down here and done this? And I'm always like, no, no, I'm, I'm kind of here for the gym. I haven't really gone out uh, hiking yeah. and, you know, done too much other stuff, but, uh, yeah. But something else I wanted to talk about because, I think uh, for a lot of casual people who watch martial arts or people who watch fighting, I don't. I think some people understand, but I don't know if they really understand the level of dedication and intensity that this sport, like any athletic sport, requires. So, can you walk me through your day today? Ah, uh, yeah, sure. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I just want to. I also want to because I, I kind of think I, I know what you do every day, but I think I'd be really cool if the listeners also can get something from that because the lifestyle that you live is a uh, very disciplined and it's very intense. Yeah, so um, most days it's hard. D- days can differ because the schedule is just a little bit different uh, depending on uh, if you have conditioning of like a morning or a night or uh, again, um, uh, which day it is on. But mm-hmm. let's just say like the average day most of the time, uh, I wake up around about, uh, <laughs> again, it, it, it depends on what classes are on on which days. Most of the time it's around about 6 or 7 a.m., then I'll go to the gym. I'll either teach a class or a private lesson first. Um, I, I have been privileged enough to help out uh, on the Alter coaching staff, which mm. is an amazing program they have at City Kickboxing and all around the world. The Alter program is really, really cool. I really appreciate being a part of that. So uh, if if the Alter mornings are on, uh, it's a much different morning. It's a 4 a.m. start. 
Um, but uh, if not, most of the time, again, like I said, it's about six or seven. I'll go, I'll teach my private sessions. Then uh, in camp, conditioning is then from eight until nine, then pro class from nine until, nine until 10.30. And then uh, I get a little bit of a break during the day. Um, I'll then use that opportunity to, I'll get home, scoot home, and uh, then eat. Uh, I get to chill out for about two, three hours. Most of the time I'll do like a little bit of yoga, a little bit of stretching out. Um, I, I try at least every second or third day to, to squeeze that in. Uh, during camp, it's more of a daily thing, but outside of camp, I'm a little more lack on it. Uh, I was doing a daily sauna too, but my sauna pro- program has recently just changed where I'm just doing it once a week now instead of every day. So that's a nice little break as well. Uh, but then pro class is back on uh, at four. So then I'll come back in at four in the afternoon, uh, do pro class, and then again, uh, teach a private session or two uh, for one to two hours after pro class. And then I normally get home around about 7 p.m. at night. And then it's, you know, have a shower and uh, make tea, spend a little bit of time with the missus and then head to bed. Yeah. And that's, that, that's like the average. Uh, again, some days are uh, more flat out than others. Again, my Friday is probably my busiest day because uh, that's a day that I'm constantly teaching the altar class. So again, mm. that's like a 4 a.m. start. I also uh, teach a striking class then as well. So then it's, I have to come into the gym a little bit earlier. I've still got my two privates that I teach that day. And then, uh, yeah, so all in all, I think I spent about – five hours just teaching alone on Fridays and then I've got to fit in my conditioning and then pro class and then uh, if my body's holding up for it, the the nighttime marathon rolls, which uh, if you do conditioning that morning can be very, very, very tough. Uh, uh, A lot of times I I tap out on the marathon rolls that night, but if I'm not doing conditioning that morning, then it'll be marathon rolls that night as well. What's the most rounds you reckon you've done in the marathon rolls? Oh, that's a great question. That's a really good question. So I think on average, they normally set it for about 10. Yeah. Um, but I know back at the old gym, like there have been times where we just set the timer and we just sort of go. And then uh, people just kind of used to drop off just like mm. as the night went on. And yeah. I know there have been multiple times where I I finished the marathon rolls at the old gym and then uh, like went away and like checked my phone. It was like getting close to like nine o'clock or something. It's like, <laughs> it's like wow, I, I went way too late today. But um, God, that you, cardio, bro, that's hard out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's it, it's a really, really cool thing. It's something that I really love about jujitsu because it just, it takes your mind off it. You're not thinking about uh, the grind the whole time. You're not mm. thinking about like, you're doing a workout session. Mm. A lot of time you're so just into thinking about not getting choked out mm. or thinking about, you know, trying to choke someone out that yeah. that thought isn't really in the back of your head. You're more just focused on jujitsu itself. Mm. Yeah. Another, um, talk, I was going to ask you this as well. Um, cause you're getting ready for the, for your fight coming up in May, right? Yeah. Yeah. May, May 11th. May 11th. Very exciting. So fighting at welterweight, you're already sort of looking at, you know, your dietary requirements and that what what because every fighter i feel like has got different sort of things they do yeah what's your sort of diet regimen in order to like not just make weight but maintain you know being healthy so this one is super different because i actually normally fight at lightweight mm. um i am a lightweight and uh, uh again I, I normally fight down at 70 kilos but um unfortunately i i had a fight lined up for lightweight but that fell through um, I was pretty disappointed. I already started like cutting down and then you offered me a fight up at welterweight. So the opportunity was just there. And I don't, the way I'm looking at my career, I, I've already missed out on a couple of things due to some outside issues. Um, I, I'm just trying to make up for lost time. So I'm jumping at every opportunity I can get right now. Mm. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm taking the fight. And, uh, so this time dietary, it's pretty pretty easy for me. I'm just trying to make sure that I'm nice and fueled for my sessions. And it's okay at the moment if I'm uh, putting on a couple of kilos, which is actually extremely nice. <laughs> Normally, it's a huge factor. It's a yeah. huge stress for Especially me. Especially to lightweight because that's a lot of cutting. Yeah. If, no- if you don't mind me asking, what's your normal like uh, so- weight? So, uh, like, uh, right now, for example, walk around, I'm like 83 kilos. Mm. Uh, that's what it was yesterday when I weighed in. Um, but... Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, I, f- uh, I fight down normally at 70. So what I'll aim to get is around 77, 76 for fight week itself. 
and then I'll cut the rest five week. Um, a lot of that comes from a really, really strict diet of cutting out uh, carbs, sodium, fiber, um, and then also the, the weight cut, the water cut right at the end. Uh, but for this camp, it's been really nice just being able to, again, like make sure I'm relatively fueled for every session. Mm. Uh, but for me, it's just like high protein, high carbs. I tend to try to stay away from fats, like, um, natural Mm. fats is great. So like fats from, uh, like, like on your steak or tuna or seafood, salmon, Mm. anything like that, that's fine. Um, but most of the time it's just like trying to get in as much protein to recover and as much carbs for energy, uh, uh, like, not as much as I can. I try not to overeat because that's still obviously something that like uh, you, you don't want to go into a session like just polished off a uh, a huge, uh, I don't know, bowl of rice or packet of chips mm. or whatever it is and mm. then, you know, feel, uh, f- feel too bloated from that session. But uh, for me personally, I like to start with uh, a little protein bar to, uh, before my morning session just to, uh, again, get me going. Um, after that it's oats, oats are like a big staple for me daily. I I love my oats for breakfast. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll have like 80 grams of oats, like a a nice big bowl. Um, then after that it's, uh, again, I'll have some more protein. So either like a protein bar, protein shake, then I'll get in some more carbs before class. So that might be some toast. That might be some rice. Um, just some, uh, again, try to keep it as healthy and as strict as possible, but, uh, again, just good solid fuel. And then overnight, it's definitely some meat and some uh, some more carbs. So most of the time, uh, for example, if I did like uh, a bowl of rice for lunch, then meat might be like um, a steak sandwich. So again, some mm. some meat, some protein, then some uh, some bread for some carbs, or vice versa. If I did like some some bread, some toast for lunch, then I'll have for tea like a good stir fry, a rice bowl, or something like that. Mm. But I just tend to try to mix it up. Um, mix around my meats. I might do fish one night. I might do chicken the next, steak the next. Again, this fight being at welterweight, I can be a little bit more lenient on right. that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, normally, I'd really have to be counting my calories and using the My Fitness Pal app flat out and uh, making sure that it's like super strict. Mm. Do you have any foods? I'm just curious because um, for me, when I come to class uh, or even actually when I do music and stuff, I have to be cautious of uh, reflux. Yeah. Do you have any foods that sort of get, did you be a bit wary oh, of that as well? Definitely. So a lot of those you learn the hard way, unfortunately. Yeah. And the sucky thing for me is like a lot of the time, a lot of really healthy foods have that effect for me. So mm. I found that I thought I was doing the right thing. Apples are a big one. Um, cause yeah. I, I like the taste of apples, but I found out that I can't have them before training. <laughs> like I, I can't uh, have an apple or two and then go to the gym because it gives me really, really bad reflux. I've actually found that salads can be the same. I used to do like a a lunchtime salad but a lot of the time like the spinach and the uh, the tomato um capskin sometimes it, it just doesn't sit with me too well so i have to save a lot of that for my nighttime meal um and not do that before training mm. but uh everyone's different with it and uh again it's just about finding the right foods that sort of sit well for you before the training session mm. have you ever um i've heard a couple of uh fighters or even just diets talking about the uh the organ meat diet have you ever looked into that sort of thing no before so having like chicken heart or like uh animal organs no because they're rich in oh gosh i can't remember the types of fibers and vitamins but they're very rich in certain fibers and vitamins and um i was wondering if you ever heard anything about that i've never personally dabbled in it but i mean like i I understand it and I wouldn't be against it. Like if I had, uh, if I was right into hunting or had a friend that was right into hunting, for example, and had like a bunch of spare hearts and livers and stuff <laughs> yeah. laying around, I, I wouldn't say no, I'd try it. But um, yeah, it's not something that I have uh, dabbled in before. Ah, uh, right. Yeah. I've just been curious about that. Cause yeah, yeah so many, I guess there are, it's all about listening to your body, like what works, what doesn't. And everyone's kind of a bit different. Like some guys don't, I feel like some guys Okay, this isn't UFC, but I guess it's just an example that comes to my head right now was old Tyson Fury, you know, just doesn't give a shit <laughs> at all what he eats by the looks of it. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's yeah. like, oh, that wow, he, he, he can get, yeah, well, that's heavyweight. But <laughs> I can, yeah, you can get away with it, but I'm just like, I'm like, oh, that's interesting. I'm like, I'm like, oh, wow, there's a lot of ways to approach it. There's no real, I mean, obviously junk food and processed food and your fizzy drinks and all that is an obvious one, but then it's like everyone's a bit different because then, uh, you know, I, I, 
okay, maybe not in fighting why well, I don't know anybody, but say like the vegan diet or vegetarian, I imagine some people do that and it probably works for them. But for someone like myself, maybe for you, like I need to have like a rich meat or something to get the energy. So that's all I know. Is there's no real right or wrong, is there? Yeah, I mean, uh, again, that like we said, the the biggest thing is find something that works well for you. Um, a lot of people, I think, get caught up in diets and they get caught up in fads and trends and think that they have to abide by certain rules. Um, but again, not not everyone's body processes things the same. And like mm. I said, I think the key is just finding certain foods, obviously healthy foods that uh, suit you best um, and that your body can digest and your body can process um, as efficiently as possible. And again, they, they don't give you, like we said, acid reflux. Uh, mm. you, you know, uh, they, they don't give you... Yeah any lingering effects, you know, yeah. that, that there's a lot of gastrointestinal problems that can come with like high protein diets and stuff like that as well. You sort of have to dabble around with. I, uh, mm. I found that the, the hard way when I was trying to up my uh, probiotics and I was uh, dipping into the Yakult diet. <laughs> and, sorry, what was the diet called? Uh, sorry, no, uh, j- just the, you know, the little Yakults, the little oh, probiotics. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, 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 yeah so yeah. Uh, I was reading about how good probiotics were and I knew that, that they were like a good staple. So earlier on uh, this year, actually, I was, I was trying to up my probiotics and I did that by drinking two of those a day. Oh, that's and a lot, yeah. It was. It, it did not do my stomach any <laughs> no, any good. It was. <laughs> it gave me quite a bit of gastrointestinal distress, which was not good for me, not good for my training partners either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. People sometimes, yeah, yeah. See, uh, this is embarrassing, but I'm gonna say it anyway. I remember once. I think it was might have been one of your classes you were taking. I was sparring, and oh man, like I just. I think I ate just not uh, early enough, and I just like. Oh man, I was. I just like my stomach was like so bad. I wasn't passing too much gas, but I just felt, I felt like, um, you might've had this as well. I just felt, I felt ill. Yeah. I was like, I need to go to the bathroom. Like something's wrong. And I just had to leave. But, um, yeah, yeah no, so every time it's, it's quite similar. It's interesting to, um, cause as like being a musician myself, there's actually a lot of similarities between the two reflux and what you eat before. Like when you play a show or like a fight, it's actually quite similar. Yep. Cause I'm um, like the, we're talking about the reflux, but also, um, if you eat like an hour before and you're trying to sing. It's not going to work for you. You're going to be belching and be burping and like, you know, like it's going to like, you know, you're doing generally like a 40 minute set. I guess most average fights, if it's three rounds, 15 minutes, would you say? Yep. Average. Yep, that's the average. You know, sure. like you've got 15 minutes of pure concentration and body high intensity and, you know, a gig, not the same, but similarities. You're really in the moment, you know, you're, you're burning calories on, on stage. Um, not to the same degree, of course, but um, to a certain degree. So it's like, I've really found that quite interesting. Like when I... I, I, when I have done sparring and training, I'm like, oh, it's like, I feel like I'm p- almost playing a show. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, no matter what you want to be, if you're performing, you want to be just function, functioning efficiently and mm. you want to, uh, yeah, not have those sort of, uh, problems in the back of your head. The, no. the, the, the less that you can worry about that and the more you can just, uh, focus on your performance is, uh, I think key. Yeah. Hard out. All right, bro. We're getting near to the end. Um, I would like to throw some quick fire questions at you. They, yeah, they're kind of quick fires, but they, <laughs> they're just questions, but I'll try to get through them quickly. So first one is, uh, misconceived perceptions about martial arts. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Have so, you got any? Oh, bro. That, <laughs> I have a list. Um, <laughs> shit. <laughs> so the biggest thing I think of there is like just McDojos and a, a huge, huge, something that even like annoys me quite a bit like Mm. uh, it gets to me um grinds my gears is uh being like a traditional martial arts a karate black belt um the mcdojo life has kind of killed what it means to be a legitimate karate black belt what it means to sorry just to explain what's a mcdojo okay ah sorry (laughs) sorry sorry a a mcdojo is just like a franchised traditional martial art that most of the time specializes in bullshit it's it's uh, <laughs> right. It's like someone, I, don't, I don't know about this. Oh, really? No. Okay, so there's, there's great pages if you look up like Mick Dojo Life and stuff like that online on socials. But uh, basically, when uh, I believe we were talking about this earlier, when there, there was like a big kickoff on like karate and traditional martial arts mm. way back more in like the, the 90s and the early 2000s, it was a little bit more of a focus. But what happened was people were even advertising like get your taekwondo black belt in a year like i remember like I've blitz about, magazines okay, and stuff like that and it's like it's just it's basically you show up 
you pay the fees and you grade, you get given your belt. And it watered down what traditional martial arts is meant to be. It watered down what a, a very effective, efficient, it doesn't matter what the martial art is. It doesn't matter if it's karate or taekwondo or whatever name you're putting on it. Mm. It takes away the legitimacy of it. And what really, really sucks about that, and again, what really grinds my gears to this day is if someone is a legitimate BJJ black belt, there is a certain a certain standard that gets put with that uh, when it comes to fighting. Like people know that that's legit. But 90% of the time, if you hear that they're a karate black belt or a taekwondo black belt, mm. it is not looked at it anywhere near the, the same regard. And mm. the reason is because of these McDojos and because people get away with, again, just not being legitimate fighters and not training themselves and not in in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, uh, it's very, very difficult to teach and to run a jiu-jitsu school if you're not doing the jiu-jitsu yourself. So mm. most jiu-jitsu guys that are running uh, schools, uh, legitimate black belts, they're, they've put their time on the mat. They've done that. Unfortunately, when it comes to karate and other McDojos, people, again, like train for like a year somewhere. Some people even just buy the belts themselves. It's, it's absolutely terrible. And then they Heard tell you that, that there's yeah mm. some like, uh, again – other <laughs> other sort of motive behind that but they're just looking at the, their school as just a way to make some money and it's um mm. again they've put they've dedicated very very little amount of their life to martial arts and they think that they can just open up a school and make some money and just get guys turning up give them their black belt they pay the fees and then like they they just run it like that rather than actually yeah, <laughs> put in the time. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Instead of actually putting in the time, because there's no way to get around that, especially yeah. very the, disingenuous. Yes, yes. And again, like you, you, you look at a lot of schools. Uh, again, it would be like if you went to a jujitsu school that then didn't decide to do any jujitsu. They didn't decide to do any rolling. They didn't decide to actually uh, like go live at all. That's what a lot of people do with karate and taekwondo, where they decide that they'll open up a school but they won't actually spar or they'll just spar, but they'll never ever do any contact. So it's all non-contact. It's all like you all just right. stop and you can get your black belt without ever like even getting hit like too serious. Mm. And again, like the idea of doing a stand up martial art and again, no receiving, contact. yeah, receiving your, your black belt without even like getting hit is, uh, <laughs> a, a, again, like <laughs> that's a I different concept. I, I totally it? get you. Yeah. That's, that's fine. I watched some, um, there's actually a video I saw of this, um, <clears throat> Speaking of karate, I think it was like a reel I watched and it popped up of this, this girl. She's black belt in karate. And I don't know if it was like with a boxer or it was with just some guy. I don't know. I think he might have been like a casual boxer. And it was like this black belt karate and she just got wrecked. Oof. Like oh, it wasn't like brutal, was, brutal. Was that a guy versus girl matchup? Yeah, it was. It was <laughs> intergender. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not not the best, but I watched it, and because this, is, but I think she agreed to it. She was like, "Yeah, this will be fine. I'm black belt." And yeah, then obviously not. And I mean, that's <laughs> that's the other thing too. Not only like as like from a morality like like point of view, where like <laughs> not only are you watering down the values of martial arts, but you're also giving people this false sense of security. Like even if it's supposed to be from not a competitive point of view, not because the person's going to go out and compete and fight, but from a self-defense point of view, mm. if you give these people their black belt and they think in the back of their head that they actually can do something if, you know, the an altercation breaks loose, they get this false sense of security that they actually can do some of these wacky moves that, again, have no legitimacy or, like, don't actually work. Mm. Um, and if anything, you're just putting them more in risk of, like, getting themselves in a worse spot and getting hurt, like, mm. far more than, uh, yeah, if you actually just did the training. <laughs> yeah. On that subject, um, what would you say out of your experience of, being around martial arts for so long, what would you say is like one of the most like you in, in practical martial arts you've seen? Like in in real situations, what's a very like kind of useless impractical martial art? <sighs> like like what which style is which, like which style? Oh, yeah, man, it's hard. It's <laughs> so, <laughs> so a lot of styles have some validity to them if they've been legitimately worked on and again like if you've put the years in and you've done real practice very few schools actually put in the real practice nowadays though but 
uh, again, a lot of Aikido or Hapkido schools, a lot of the time are doing these crazy wrist locks that work quite well if you go along with them. Mm. But as soon as you don't and you apply some resistance or instead of grabbing the person's chest, you punch them in the face, it sort of all goes out the window. Mm. And it, um, and like I said, it, it doesn't do it doesn't do anyone any good. It doesn't do any good for the the martial arts. It doesn't do any good for the person paying for, I don't know what they're paying for at that point because they're not getting <laughs> self-defense and they're not competing. So I don't know what they're, the, what they're paying for but <laughs> to be a part of a cult, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Potentially, potentially. Um, I know you're a bit of an anime man. Uh, what's your favorite anime at the moment? Oh, great question. Great question. So, uh, my favorite anime would have to go to Naruto for sure. Um, and it's hard. I don't think it can ever change because a lot of like what I value of Naruto is like growing up, learning like the lessons and the the, 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 the sort of values of that show. I took it like way too deep. I think I, <laughs> I focused like way too much on some of the characters from there. But um, yeah, yeah. Uh, again, um, just from a nostalgic point of view and from like a value point of view, from an artistic point of view, I really like this style. I like some of the fights. I like the strategy. I like the story and the world building. Um, I think they really, really nailed nearly everything. There's just a little too much backstory, a little too much repeats that they go mm. through, and I think they rush the ending there. But, um, uh, yeah, Naruto and Naruto Shippuden, um, de- definitely my favorite. Mm. That's cool. And you've got a, yeah, if, if you want to show you, you've got the Pokemon tattoos. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to be able to. Yeah, get them <laughs> to, all to, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm not going to be able to pull this sleeve up. Um, but yeah, so Pokemon is definitely. It, it's funny because I look at that as a little bit more, nearly a little bit more of a video game than anime for me. It actually mm. originated as a video yeah, game. Yeah, well, that started as a what was it called? Pocket Monsters. Yes. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah, in yeah. Japan. Yeah. 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 And uh, then they turned it into an anime. But again, I do have like just hard nostalgic values that. The Pokemon and the the tattoo in general is actually pretty pretty meaningful for myself. Um, as I got to age sixteen, I was still quite a Pokemon fan, and I was really ashamed of it. Uh, <laughs> so like, it got it got hard. Like when I was younger, it was fun, it was cool to like Pokemon. But then you get to that age where you know you start to like girls, and you don't yeah. want the girls to know that you like Pokemon. Yeah. Um, so what were you doing this weekend? It's like, oh, it was just a home. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly, right? Like people would see me because I'd take my Game Boy and stuff of my Nintendo DS to high school and people would ask me what I'm playing. Like, oh, just games, you know. Yeah. Just <laughs> <laughs> um, but again, I used to hide it and I used to be ashamed of it. So then getting it tattooed, I kind of like, I wear it on my sleeve on the daily and like proud that um, I like what I like, you know. Again, I spent years trying to hide it. And even trying to uh, work, like find my own ways around it. Again, I was like kind of ashamed of it. So I tried to look f- mm. for other video games to play that was the same thing. Yeah. So like I tried to look for like other RPGs where you'd go around like, you know, fighting monsters or something like that and capturing them and stuff. But uh, th- there was there was nothing else like it. And again, I think the nostalgic like attachment I have um, with Pokemon really just has ingrained itself where it gives me something, uh, a feeling that not any other sort of video games or animes or TV shows do. Mm-hmm. I remember one of my first like Easter presents that wasn't chocolate. I can remember my mum went out on Easter one day and she came back with a Kmart bag and it was Easter. So I was expecting just more chocolate. Yeah. And she brought out a VHS of Pokemon, the first movie. Oh. Oh, such a good movie. Uh, again. Uh, That's yeah. deep. Yeah. Oh, bro. That, that, <laughs> that is so deep. You look oh, at like some of the cuts from that movie. That gosh. has some amazing life yeah. lessons that to I this think, day you um, can value. I don't know if it was the first, because I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan too, but the first or second one, I can't remember where Mewtwo is like, there's a scene of him like going down in like the water, like drowning. And he's just talking about how like, I'm just an experiment. And I'm just like, oh my gosh. I mean, <laughs> yeah, uh, Mew and Mew 2 yeah. have this conversation at the end of the first movie where they talk about how, uh, like, uh, how we can all be the same. Um, sorry, how, how people can be born of different circumstance, but at the end of the day, we're, we're, we're all the same. And, you know, mm. we should all, like, be getting along rather than, like, fighting against course, one another. Of course. Um, uh, a- again, uh, dependent on our life circumstances. But, uh, yeah, uh, so 
for, <laughs> for, for me, I, I looked for years on ways to get around my, my love for Pokemon and <laughs> tried to like get it onto something a little bit more yeah. adult, yeah, but yeah. I just never could. Nah, and then that's cool. I still, I, I, go, I still play it sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I've just learned to embrace it. And then again, um, so my tattoo, I actually got, uh, is like merging two of my favorite things, which is like Pokemon and martial arts, which I can get up mm. a little bit. You can see the Bulbasaur line. Yeah. I've got the original cool. starters. Yeah, so yeah. the Bulbasaur line is like, um, it's him, but it, he gets like Muay Thai wraps and it's like a striking sort of tree where, uh, again, he has a little bit of uh, like scar tissue from like, uh, it's very, very common for most Muay Thai fighters. They'll end up with a little bit of scar tissue on, in, over their eye, like mm. from all the elbows and stuff. So, you know, by the time he gets to Venusaur, he's got the, uh, the the scar tissue, but he's also got the, the bands um, and the, the headgear. So basically the, the tattoo kind of represents, I've got, one path, which is the striking path, one path, which is the jujitsu path, and one path, which is the wrestling path. And it shows their progression in that specific sport, but it also shows the wear and tear on their body from that specific mm. sport. Um, so, again, like the wrestling side has like the cauliflower ears. Uh, again, the, the jujitsu side is like a Charizard. He ends up like with the finger tape, which is extremely common in gi jujitsu. You, uh, you don't see <laughs> too many high level uh, black belts compete without like a whole lot of finger tape on, uh, yeah. especially in the gi. But mm. um, yeah, it's just um, something that I think was pretty important to me because i like both of those things but again i wanted to uh, be comfortable with myself expressing both of the, both of those things and in the past uh i have been I, again like uh i'm not as sure if you use the word ashamed as much when it comes to martial arts but i've definitely hidden it from people you know like when people like ask me like uh, w w uh, what I do for work and that yeah. sort of stuff and what I'm like sort of doing with my life. Mm. It's sort of a mm. thing where, especially when I lived back in Tassie, it was looked at as like a little bit of like a drop kick sort of. Uh, Doing martial it, arts. It's, it's not a real job, you know? Mm. Um, oh, yeah. hundred. That's like with so many things, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So it was something that like I, I was following my passion, but mm. I sort of felt it was a... Um, it was something that not most people would agree with. No, most people are scared of people who follow their passions. That's what I think it is. I think there's a lot of fear in my, from my experience, uh, of people who try and do things. They're like, oh, I really love this and it's going to be hard, but I want to do it. And why would you do that? You can't afford a house. You can't save money. You can't do this and that. But then it's like, you're the one who gets to live the life you love. And then someone's stuck doing a job that they hate, but they were told that that's the best option. Yeah, and they like have, that, that happens so much they use it uh, to justify their own yeah. reasoning sort of thing yeah and it's just um it's unfortunate um so but the, i've i've noticed a lot uh, a lot of that in my life as well all right sweet bro that was cool Ex explanation of the tats dope i didn't know you had like the wrestling and like the disco that's cool i did that was cool i thought it was just like you love pokemon <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> so a lot of people i should probably like put up a, a post about it but a, a mm. lot of people um yeah just see it and they just think it's a pokemon tattoo but yeah no, it's um <laughs> it's very very um martial arts ingrained as well yeah that's awesome all right dude so may 11th yeah, yeah. In so Townsville. I, I guess I should, yeah, pump, pump up. Um, pump, yeah, yeah. Finally. Uh, after, Jack, Jack Jones, is that the, the uh, Jack James. Oh, Jack James, sorry. Yeah, yeah uh, all good, all good. So, um, yeah, after a little bit of time off, unfortunately, due to injury and uh, a couple of surgeries and just getting my body right, um, I'm now finally in fighting fit shape. I'm feeling strong. I'm feeling good. And, um, yeah, ready to, to come back on May 11th and put on a damn good show and remind everyone that, I'm different. Remind everyone yeah. that I've got a little bit of that X factor, a little bit of something special. Um, looking forward to putting on a great show. It's uh, against an extremely tough guy, um, a, a big guy too. Not only that, it's a it's a welterweight who's like coming down from middleweight, and I'm a lightweight who's like not really known as being a big lightweight, but I'm going up to welterweight <laughs> anyway to, to to give it a good crack. He's also a BJJ black belt. And um, a, a proficient striker as well, really, really strong um, fundamentals. Um, he's also been uh, traveling rounds, uh, done a lot of uh, work in Thailand and stuff. Again, it's not a fight at all that I'm taking lightly, um, but it's definitely, it's going to be a damn strong fight. And again, it's something that I look forward to reminding people that, uh, yeah, again, I'm different. Yeah. Awesome, bro. Hey, man, I really appreciate you coming on, chatting about your story and your love for martial arts. And um, I think a lot of people are going to get, I hope, will take a lot away from this. 
Thank so, you very um, much. Thank you so much for having me. This has been, yeah, really fun, man. And I uh, I really love what you've done with the place. It's like a cool <laughs> little studio here. That's cool. Thank, thanks, bro. We, I try. I try. All good. All right. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Make sure you check out Adam uh, online, Smiling Assassin. Follow him. And uh, May 11th. You'll I'm, I'm beat down for, promotions. Yeah, Let's yeah. go. Let's fucking go, man. All right. Awesome. Thank you, everyone, for listening. All right. Bye. Bye.